Yo guys, what's going on? Lucky Rave is back again to give you guys a celebration for My Hero Academia. A celebration filled with tears and joyful memories on a retrospective for the manga's journey. And for me, that's saying a lot. That is honestly saying a lot for me because I'm sure... For a lot of people, I can't speak for everybody, but I got into My Hero Academia actually a little over 10 years ago on August 25th, 2014. And around that time, Naruto was coming to an end. And I just saw one brief like shot of My Hero Academia. And I thought, oh, a manga about superheroes. That looks really awesome. And the chapter that had come out at the time was chapter 7. And from there, I just kept on reading it week to week. And, yo, like, the, this series, like, really thinking about it in perspective, okay? So let's look at it like this. Because, and again, everybody's got a different take on My Hero Academia. And for me, this is just my own journey. So at the time when My Hero Academia was going on in the manga, USJ arc started. Pretty much when the League of Villains first started. And that was, like, a super big deal. I'm not gonna lie, reading that week to week, like, that had me on edge when, like, Sugar Rocky pulled up with the boys and the Nobu. I was like, whoo! Okay. Like, this is gonna be interesting. And I just thought, we're, like, barely, like, 50 chapters in. We're already getting threats? That's it's already, like, monumental. So, you go from that, and then, of course, after that arc, you get the classic, you know, tournament arc, you know, like the Dark Tournament, the Chunin Exams Hunters Exam. In this case, you had the UA Sports Festival. I can say for certain, that's kind of when it started blowing up for the manga. That sports festival did so much. And in fact, even when it came to the anime, I do remember that My Hero Season 1 did pretty good, but it wasn't like a huge talk, from what I remember. The big blow up for my hero happened with this arc. This arc in particular, especially for the anime, was like huge. There would be discussions going on for days on Twitter. Okay? A each week, each week an episode dropped regarding the sports festival, people would be like, yo, did y'all see that latest episode? Yo, did y'all see what Deku just did? Did you see what Bakugo just did? That Ochigo fight. That was Next level. These matchups that are happening, Deku versus Todoroki, like, the conversation, like, as a manga reader, that was the golden period of my hero, okay? Seeing that had me going like, damn. I don't know if this means something to you, but it means something to me. That's special. And not only that, but one thing I do want to preference. The day the anime got announced, like, I was... That really moved me. And it got me so excited, too, because when season one was starting, I kid you not, in the manga, that's when we were at the hideout radar. And for those of you that need a little bit of a refresher course, the hideout radar was when Bakugo got captured. And there was a whole rescue point of like just saving him. But also, more importantly, All Might versus All for One, okay, that Week to week, I'm not going to lie, that was one of the most stressful times reading the manga. Because I thought that we're setting up the death of all my I was like, oh shit. Classic, like, mentor figure, like, you know, dying within the story. You know, like, Jiraiya, Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon. You know, the, the whole Star Wars factor into it, right? Which... It's no surprise. We know Koei loves Star Wars. I mean, for crying out loud. He's throwing in references, like, here and there. Like, freaking Dagoba, Tatooine. The final chapter, like, I think there was, like, a small reference, right? Like, Star Wars way or Highway or something like that. I, I was just like, bro. Like, dude, even in the Star and Stripe arc, you had freaking Akbar. Now, obviously, it wasn't Akbar, but you could tell just design-wise. I'm, like, thinking... Yo, Koei must have not been a huge fan of The Last Jedi. He's like thinking, 
I'm gonna bring Akbar and put him in here. Which, what was the show you love for Star Wars? Plus, you look at the volume cover for uh, 20 of My Hero Academia, which in my opinion, like peak volume covers, okay? Volume 20, I will easily say is like top five. Debatable, right? It's super debatable on like where you rank the volume covers, but volume 20 was such a special cover. But you can clearly see the Star Wars reference there. But the beginning all the way up until the provisional license exam, okay? Which I know a lot of people are like 50, not 50 50, but I know some people found that art to be a little dull. But I thought it was really cool to see like all the characters, you know, doing whatever it took to like get their license. I love the content of it and I love like what it took, the strides that they had to take to achieve those like successes Th that was really cool to see but i will say up until that point for me personally i was like my hero academia pure perfection then i will say the first half of the internship arc. in this case the overhaul arc okay the first half of that arc was really great and before anyone starts commenting on anything, let me just say this right now. The overhaul arc, like, as a whole, is a great arc. But what I will say, reading that week to week was kind of a chore, I will admit. Because once they got to the base, that's when I kind of started noticing a bit of, like, an issue with the manga. Where it was like, okay, we're not really progressing too much on the story. Sometimes you need like those little areas where you're stuck. But that's kind of like the early signs too of like Koei's health. If you look at where he was at from the beginning to the provisional license exam, right? So that's like what? That's like what? The first 13 volumes of the series? That was like Koei Horikoshi at the prime. But you could definitely notice his health was starting to deteriorate. Just from that point. Now again, it wasn't like as consistent as it was like say in the final war. But that's where it was starting. Every like now and then like he'd take a break, but it wasn't like as consistent as it was like towards the end. Aside from pacing issues, I thought that arc was great. You also had a very big, like significant moment in the story where Night Eye dies. That death was a pretty significant moment in the story. For my hero academia, I will admit that's like the one point in in the series where I was like, "Dude, we lost a big character." Like Night Eye's death was huge. So again, if the biggest takeaway for that arc was pacing, that's okay. And then you get to the culture festival, and a lot of people want to say this is when my hero started to fall off. You think you can do this to me? I don't know about you guys. Culture festival was like a lot of fun. I had so much fun with that arc. Plus, you had Gentle. What's there not to love about Gentle? That was, oh my god. It was so refreshing to have a villain just wanting to be a villain for, like, attention. Okay? He wasn't being a villain because he was like, oh, ha, 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 I want to take over the world. Nothing like that. No, Gentle was just a down-to-earth dude, just doing things for views. Which I thought was like, wow, that's actually kind of amusing. Not gonna lie. And plus, you also had Deku, like, figuring out ways to, like, utilize his abilities. You know, which I thought was a nice stepping point for his character. And then you had the pro-hero arc, which, I mean, there's nothing wrong to say about the pro-hero arc. The pro-hero arc was great. Great kid. That was, like, one of the turning points for Endeavor. Definitely. That arc did so much for Endeavor, and I know Endeavor is such a controversial character when it comes to the community. I will say it right now. Endeavor, my opinion, top 10. Without a shadow of a doubt. But that arc in particular did so much for Endeavor. Seeing where he had been from the beginning of the series to that point, now Endeavor had to step up. He was before the number two hero. And then he went on to being, you know, the number one hero. And obviously, that was a goal of his. He wanted to strive to be the number one hero. 
Like, he didn't like the fact that it was being passed down to him. He wanted it to be a case where he beat All Might fair and square for that position. But, because, you know, with the rise of the villain saga, you could say up until, like, the Pro Hero arc, it was still pretty good. It was still, like, a great series. He arguably even amazing. Like, it went from being perfection to arguably, like, amazing. Then you got to the joint training run, and again, everyone's opinion is going to be different on this. At the time, I was one of the people that wasn't rocking with Deku getting the six quirks. Because I kind of thought, yo, we're going to make him, like, super busted as hell. There's no way. Like, if we're going to talk about, like, the characters, like, keeping up with Deku, like, we're just going to make him super powerful. There, there needs to be, like, a repercussion on this. And you have to keep in mind about this, too. At the time when the joint training arc was going on, no one had an idea what the six work were going to be. That's the, that's the one thing I want to address. Because being a manga reader, I remember those six quirks, when they were introduced, like, the outcry was nuts, okay? And like I said, you either had people walking with it or you had people, like, just, what? Like, what is that? And like I said, my initial reaction was, are we just going to make Deku, like, that powerful as a character? Like, there needs to be limitations on that. Like, I'm all up for power-ups, but... Are we being punked? I hate that. We know about the Black Whip, but what about the other five quirks? That's where my concern is. Like, what were the other five quirks going to be? And we eventually found out that when it came to the other five quirks, it was basically utilities. That's what the other five quirks were, because Bakugo said it himself, oh, these other quirks are kind of trash. They're like utilities. Black Whip. Kind of like, you know, web swing, right? That's what that was. And then Danger Sense, a.k.a. Spider Sense, right? Then you had Smoke Screen. Then you had Float, which was pretty much like Superman, right? Then you had Fajin and Gear Shift. That was it. Like I said, the, all these quirks that we had were like utility based. So... When I looked at it from that perspective, I thought to myself, okay, now these like these quirks aren't bad. We found that out during the Endeavor Agency. But before that, we had the Meta Liberation on hand. And oh my god. Let me just say this right now. If the joint training arc had me fallen out of love with My Hero Academia like for that period of time, Meta Liberation Army brought me back in. Because... You have to understand this. Jigaraki, at that point in time, was, like, not to be seen for, like, a long time, okay? Keep in mind about this. Last time Shigaraki showed up was the end of the internship. Right? Like, he shows up in front of Overhaul and, like, takes the drug. I was like, dude, for a good period of time, you didn't see Shigaraki in the thing. Like, from the remedial course arc, Culture Festival arc, even the Pro Hero arc, the most you had was Gavi. That was it. You didn't have anything on Shigaraki. The entirety of, like, that core. Shigaraki was not in the thing. And then, Metal Liberation Army arc hit, and I got super intrigued. I was like, whoa. Okay, Shigaraki's back in the picture. And then I had to think to myself, is this a one-time thing, or, like, are we actually, like, full-time, like, focusing on Shigaraki? And, like, the chapters kept building up. And they were building up, and I thought, oh my god. Koei's, like, going on a real ballsy route here with my rack deck. A whole story arc where we're focusing on the villains? Really? You must regale me with all the thrilling details. That set up so much for Shigeru Rock, and I loved every second. Now, sure, could the arc have been somewhat better? Obviously. But with what it was doing for Shigeru Rock, you see, with where he was at that point in the story, because you have to keep in mind, Shigaraki was like the successor to all for for all, to all for one, much like how Deku was a successor to All Might. So you have a parallel contrast here, where you saw how powerful Deku was getting in the joint training, arc. and this would kind of be like Shigaraki's like rise to power, where you know he starts off at zero. That's the thing. After All for One is like taken, Shigaraki has doesn't have any resources. He only has like Spinner, Dobby, Toga, and like. You know, compress and the one thing he had to do, it got to Maki. 
that was the big thing about that arc. And just seeing that for Shigaraki, loved that at that point in time. I really did. Like I said, the Endeavor Agency arc, big, heavy, focused arc on Endeavor once again. But it also goes to show you Koei's strength. We can all agree on this, but the Todoroki family subplot, easily one of the best things about My Hero Academia as a whole. Especially for a setup arc for the war we were about to get. Amazing. Then you get to the Paranormal Liberation of the okay? And I loved that arc. I wouldn't say it was peak. Simply because, okay, yes, you had casualties. You did. But, Gran Torino should have died. And I love Gran Torino, okay? Gran Torino is cool. He's amazing. But let's be fair. After the Paranormal Liberation War, dude had no purpose. Again, for like a mid-war arc, you did see like Shigaraki being taken over by All for One. Get Shigaraki to like release me from the prison. Which was, by itself, I thought for the longest time, we were gonna get a prison break arc. Granted, the prison break arc like lasted for like, what, maybe like a chapter or two, at most. But that was still, like, an insane time. But reflecting back on it, many people thought that the Paranormal Liberation War arc was, like, the last peak of the series. Because, and that arc ends with Deku leaving UA. I remember thinking at the time, oh my god, we took the hero and we're making them leave the Academy. That is an interesting choice. I remember thinking at the time, well, okay, Deku obviously is going to go back to UA. But the question I always had was, would he come back as a student or would he just be like, okay, look. I'll still come back and talk with you. But with what I went through with all the shit that I've, I've done, like with all the things I've seen, I can't be a student. I'll still come back here to talk with y'all, but like that was my thought process. Which brings us over to the final act saga. And like I said, if the Metal Liberation Army arc had me super intrigued and got me right back into My Hero Academia, the Dark Hero arc. I fell right back in love with the scene. That should tell you something. The greatness, the awesome sauce, the quest of ingenuity, the vertex of imagination, the epic of epics, the legend among legends. We're going somewhere with Deku. This is going to be awesome. This is going to be amazing. Potentially even perfection. And I was right about that. For the most part. Because the dark hero arc was such a great deconstruction of Deku's character. Because you have to think about this. Where Deku was at the beginning of the season, getting to that point in the story, it said so much. Because you saw everything Deku experienced in that war arc. And he thought to himself, I can't let anybody else get hurt. I have to shoulder all the burdens of responsibility onto myself. And when you take that concept and put it into Deku, he doesn't start off that way in the Dark Hero arc, but you see him like slowly descend into that. Because he is thinking, okay, let me distance myself from you, way. I'm by myself, I'm with the pros, we're gonna hunt down all for one. We're gonna find Shigaraki. And after what happens to Lady Nagant, which by the way, Lady Nagant is like, you know, best girl in the series. I love like Lady Nagant. Not just for her appearance, but her backstory and seeing what she went through. Beautiful, right? But that being said, you get to that fight, you get to that conclusion, and you see how that's where Deck gets chased, okay? Because he does encounter All for One. But then All for One just says, yo, you think you're playing 40 chess? Think again. You're next. Reading that at the time, like, that was such a powerful impact because as soon as he said that, it was like, boom. Like, the mansion blew up. And. Then we can kind of get to see with what's been going on with Deku. He's relentless. He hasn't taken a break. He's saying, we can't let this go to waste. We gotta find all for one. We gotta find Shigaraki. We gotta stop them. Like, Deku was taking no breaks. Okay? He was doing whatever it took to find the guy. To find these people and just put it all to an end. And I was worried for Deku. I kind of thought, man, like, bro, I get what you're doing. Like, you need a rest. Like, just take a break. Even All Might was saying, too, like, look, kid, I get what you're doing. But, you know, you haven't eaten anything. When Deku's just looking at All Might saying, like, yo, it's it's fine. I, I'm doing okay. When obviously he wasn't. And with all the stuff I'm saying, it, it was, like, damn near perfect. Okay? It was a damn near pure perfection. 
The only drawback I would say the Dark Hero arc had was, like, going from that point in the story to when he meets up with to Class 1A, which I love the fight, and I love what it took for us to, you know, get Deku to come back. I do love that. Going all the way up until the point where he apologized to Deku in the Dark Hero arc, and getting that, I'm like, Whoa. Oh my god. That that was a huge thing for Bakugo. And granted, you could already see signs of Bakugo like changing from the end of the provisional license exam arc, even going up to when he takes the bullet for Deku in the paranormal world. I think that speaks a lot to you there. But also, there is also a big thing for Ochiko in this arc too, because even though they dragged Deku back to UA, the second people started badmouthing him, he told him it was going to be okay. She held his hand. She was like, look, it's okay. We're here. And nothing's going to happen. And then she takes the center stage, steps up for Deku, and, oh, dude, that just hit so freaking deep. Having said all of that, though, I just wish we spent a little bit more time on you know, like, Deku's, like, descent. Like, from the mansion, like, I think you could have spent maybe three or four chapters, like, really, like, delving into, like, just how far Deku was going. In my opinion. Like, that's the only drawback I get I get for that. Which, again, to me is, like, super minor. Like, in the grand scheme of things, it's, like, a super minor, like, nitpick. But, it does take what would have been, like, a pure perfection arc to my opinion, like, an amazing plus arc. Which, for anyone curious, that's, to me, equivalent to a 9.5 out of 10. So, like I said, damn near perfect arc. If you had just expanded a little bit more from Deku, hunting people down, hunting down other villains, before he meets up with Class 1A again, you would have had, in my opinion, a pure perfection arc right there. But, then you get to Star and Stripe. And here's the thing. And the Star and Stripe arc, I thought it was good. Obviously, it wasn't great. It wasn't amazing. But for Shigaraki, it was cool to see with what he was able to do, what he was capable of doing against Star and Stripe. But it was, you had a double-edged sword situation with that arc. Because if you had had it to where Shigaraki loses, that takes away his credibility as an antagonist. And if you got rid of Star and Stripe, it would have been like one of those cases of you had just introduced this new character only to kill her off. There's not much to explore with her character. And that's the biggest drawback with that arc. Is you don't have her running into All Might or with Deku or Class 1A. Being like a mentor figure for a brief period of time, right? Star and Stripe, like, say, had survived that fight. She runs into Deku. She runs into All Might. You know, she, she's able to be a mentor for the class for, like, a brief period, right? And then you kill her off in, in like, the final war. Would have been better, man. That would have been much, much better, in my opinion. But that's not the direction we want, right? We had it to wear Shigaraki, destroy Star and Stripe, and that was that. And like I said, I didn't hate the arc. It was short, but... Overall, for that arc in particular, I thought, okay, it's you go from the Dark Hero arc to Star and Stripe, and it's it's good. It's not great. It's not amazing. It's just good. And then you get to the famous UA Trader arc, something many people, many many people thought, is this subplot ever going to see the light of day? Because it seemed like something Koi was building up, and just kind of dropped. But. This arc in particular, I'm going to say this right now, I thought this was a great arc, which is saying so much, okay? This was a great arc for My Hero Academia in more ways than one, and let me tell you why. Because, especially if you read the volume edition, you got insight from Koei as to what this arc was supposed to be, like what he had intended. He says this. I originally planned to reveal Aoyama's secret in the forest training camp, like from volumes 9 and 10. 
Which, if you think about it, that would have been huge. Like, could you imagine what it would have been like if we had revealed Oyama being the traitor, like, all the way back then? And it goes to show you something. That, with Koei, changes were made along the way for the story. That's the thing. A lot of people want to say Koei Horikoshi fell off. But knowing this, because, here's the thing. Originally, when it came to this whole UA Trader arc subplot, I thought to myself, this arc was, like, good plus at best. But then knowing about this kind of increased it slightly to great. And I want to say why. Because, like I said, Koei originally wanted this to be revealed back in, like, Volume 9 and 10. And I kind of thought to myself, what would that have been like? Like, if he had planned to reveal Oyama's secret back then, that, again, that would have been a huge game changer. I think you would have seen my hero, like, viewed very differently. You would have viewed it very, very differently if you had revealed it that early on. And it, honestly, it kind of got me curious, what would have Oyama, Oyama's role have been in this? So, knowing that, I kind of thought, well, okay. You finally brought to light who the big traitor was. And I will say this. I think if Koei stuck to his original plan, like if, because obviously him saying this right here does say editorial interference. That's one. It, uh, right then and there, this shows, okay, you had some editorial interference. But after this point, then we get to the big, the final war. And I didn't actually get a chance to cover the Final War arc, but I will say this. It had its ups, it had its downs, but thinking about this in, this whole thing in perspective, this Final War was the end-all be end. And I knew, somewhere in my gut feeling, bringing this whole thing full circle, okay, I kind of thought to myself, would Koei Horikoshi and My Hero Academia's manga on the 10-year anniversary. And, you know, we come to find out that he did. He was able to do that. And, again, I'm not going to specifically talk about, like, my overall thoughts and my ratings on the final war arc, because I want to leave that as, like, a tease. Okay, that is going to be my tease for, like, an upcoming podcast that I'm going to be doing with my friends over in the Annie Manga Circle gang. Like, we're going to be doing a podcast for my Hero Academia's final arc. And when I do that podcast, you will find out what my overall stance is for the arc. But looking at the journey from there, looking at where we are at now with My Hero Academia, with its final act, it wasn't perfect. But I do have a lot of great memories of this arc. I really do. Even with its hiccups, even with like the flaws it has, no series is perfect. You're gonna have a lot of you're gonna have like some heavy highs, okay, when it comes to storytelling. But you're gonna also have some low points. That's just storytelling in and of itself. But in my opinion, I don't regret getting into my hero academia. For a series that I started ten years ago and getting to where I am today, who I was ten years ago versus who I am today. Personality-wise, I'm still the same guy, but, like, in terms of, like, my growth and, like, things I've learned over the years, that's the part that's changed. I will say, reading that final chapter, without giving a rating, it really spoke a lot about my view on the series. Like, I thought about Deku, I thought about the journey, and looking at it from that perspective, with the anime, with season two, Season 3, All My Versus All for One. All these other big, incredible moments, too, okay? Like, I've been talking about this. The Dark Hero Army, Paranormal Liberation War, uh, Meta Liberation Army, which, again, I, I will say this, I'm still disappointed that the Meta Liberation Army got the treatment that it did with the anime, because that, that to me, still bothers me to no end. I'm, like, thinking, guys, Yet to the best arc and only shrunk it down to five episodes? <laughs> Say what? Like I said, do I have any regrets with getting into the series? No. I don't. 
because this story, where it starts off, where we end up, the journey of getting to this point, again, even with its bumps in the roads, speaks volumes. It speaks real volumes of what Koei Horikoshi was able to present, and I commend Koei for what he was able to do. Getting rid of Deku's point. And I know it was something a lot of people were not informed. I know that. But I kind of thought to myself, well, one for all and all for one are like two sides of the same coin, right? If you think of it as like light and darkness, yin and yang. Without one, the other cannot survive. You get rid of one of them, and there's like a big like vacuum in space, right? A huge unbalance happens. And I kind of thought to myself, well, say you get rid of all for one, both the quirk and the person. Deck is the only one left. But would that cause a huge upset, a huge uproar, an unbalance in the universe? So for Koei to go that direction and say, the only way to stop all for one, only way to stop Shigaraki, you have to sacrifice one for all. It was such a powerful moment. It really was. And like I said, I know a lot of people aren't rocking with that. I know. But the way Koi was able to take that approach, in a way, bring it back full circle. With Deku being quirkless again. It was very reminiscent of the first chapter where, you know, Deku's quirkless again. Okay? He's quirkless. He's, he's reflecting on his journey, everything that happened. And for the most part, he was content with it. Okay, he was very content with his life. And just like the first chapter, All Might says, you've earned this. With everything you've done in life, your actions, much like how he told Deku, you, you too can be a hero. He says that once again in the final chapter. Like, you've earned this fair and square. His way of saying, for your efforts, for everything you've done. Don't just sit on the wayside. You have the right. You have the freedom. You have exactly what it takes to be a hero. And he gives them the suit. Which, I want to say this. You want to know what Koei Horikoshi envisioned Deku to be originally? A corkless hero who relied on gadgets. That was the original vision he had for Deku. The reason why he had one for all was because of an editor suggestion, okay? Maybe you should go with the approach of like giving him a hero just to make him stand out. And I honestly thought it was really cool to see Koei bring that back into light. It's like, look, the story is about to end. Deku lost one for all. But that doesn't mean he can't be a hero. And what does he do? He goes back on his original concept, making Deku a hero who relies on Gadget. To me, it was it was a befitting ending that he can still be a hero. It's a powerful moment. It really is. And I think that speaks so much to, you know, Koei's ability just as a writer, as a manga. And, you know, yes, look, I'm aware that we still have one big subplot left open, and that is the whole Izuku-Ochiko pairing. That was kind of left up in the air, which... You know, you get to chapter 429, and, like, that was such a heavy, like, Izuku Ochiko chapter, okay, because you have the little tease with green tea, which, for anyone who doesn't know, Midoriya means green valley, Ochiko means tea child. So, kind of take both aspects of those last names, and you get green tea. But in the chapter 429, it starts off, and, like, you see people, like, passing out bottles of green tea, and to me, that just spoke... That's Koei's, like, envision of Izuku and Ochiko. Like, that's the couple he's been going for since day one. And, like, yes, while we didn't get a full-on pairing confirmation in the chapter, the final chapter, I do believe 100% when we get the volume edition, we're going to get some closure on that. I do believe that 100%. That's going to be there. And if it's not there, Koei, we need to have some work. But bringing it back full circle to the closing pages of the final chapter, getting that final shot where you have Deku with his friends, 
Like, that hit. Thinking about it now, like, in retrospect, everything with this series, what I'm going to be doing with my Hero Academia moving forward is I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back and reread from volume to volume, and then I will do a discussion video, maybe even a stream, on, like, volume one, just reminiscing my thoughts, where we were at currently. And even, like, doing some discussion videos, too, because I have already seen a lot of people thinking, yo, my hero agency, anyone? We gonna get that? Are we? I mean, time will be the teller. Time will be the teller of that. Easy QX, Ochiko, that whole ship discussion. There's a lot there, too. There is a lot there that needs to be discussed. But, man, having said all of that, though, that is pretty much all I have to say when it comes to this final journey video. And, oh my god, just thinking about it, it's sad to see it go. Like, it really is just so, so sad to see it go. But, as they say, all good things must come to an end. And, we still got the anime. We still got the final volume coming out, which I have already said. I do believe 110% we're going to be getting extra content in the final one. What has been your personal journey with My Hero Academia? Do you have any favorite bits from the series? Any bits you think could have been improved on? And aside from that, guys, that's pretty much it. I'm Lucky Rave. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more My Hero Academia content, anime and manga content. And I will catch you guys on the flip side. Laters.